Good evening, Gayla Kasla, and welcome to the Mount Waddington North Island All Candidates Meeting. I am speaking to you today from the North Island on the traditional territory of the Kwakwakiwak peoples. This meeting is sponsored by the Portman Meal and District Chamber of Commerce. My name is Eric Dugovich. I'm the president of the PMCC, and I will be your moderator. It's time to introduce the candidates. Our Green Party candidate is Alexandra Morton. Our Liberal Party candidate is Norm Facey. Our NDP candidate is Michelle Babchuk. Our Conservative Party candidate is John Twig. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank nice, you. To, nice to be here. Before we begin with opening remarks on behalf of the Port McNeil and District Chamber of Commerce and all of us in the North Island, I would like to thank the candidates for agreeing to participate in this question period. I would also like to thank them for offering to step up and provide four years of leadership advocacy for the North Island and our constituents. The North Island is a geographically and demographically diverse riding. Today's discussion is intended to provide residents of Port McNeil and the greater regional district of Mount Waddington with an ability to make an informed decision about who should lead and represent them in the legislature. In light of that, you will find the questions are very much focused on local issues and challenges. Many of the questions have been provided by local residents and stakeholders. Within the chamber board, we have been using the expression, all hands on deck. Everybody knows what that means to describe where we are at currently. Our challenges started months before COVID-19 and we are very much in need of strong leadership and a unifying vision for the future. Our hope is that one of you has the wisdom and ability to provide that leadership and that we as a collective have the wisdom and courage to choose that candidate. A quick summary of the rules and format for tonight's debate. Each candidate will begin with a three minute introduction period where they may introduce themselves, their parties or their platforms. However, what they wish to discuss is at the discretion of the candidate. Following the introductions, we will enter the question period. Questions were submitted by the public, local government, and organizations from the North Island. They were selected from a working group of the Port McNeil Chamber of Commerce. The candidates have received a complete list of the questions. However, in the interest of time, we will not be able to discuss all questions submitted. That said, the candidates are encouraged to provide written answers, which we will post on the PMCC website and social media. And I have to confess that I supplied an extra supply of questions that were quintessentially uh, regional district of Mount Waddington centric because I wanted the candidates to inform themselves about the issues on this part of the North Island. <clears throat> A random selection process has deemed the order of speakers to be as follows. To start, Norm Facey, Michelle Babchuk, John Twig, Alexandra Morton. This order will move down by one consecutively after each question to ensure fairness. Candidates will be called by name before answering each question and thanked at the conclusion of their allotted time. A tone will sound at 10 seconds, indicating the end of the answer period, and a bell will indicate the end of the candidate speaking. Candidate microphones will be muted if they cannot conclude answers, uh, answering their statements in a reasonable time. We wish to avoid muting candidates and request the answer questions within the allotted time. There will be no open debate due to the limitations of this virtual platform. That said, the candidates did have a live debate in Campbell River last night. And for those of you who did not see it live, you may be through our website. At the end of this event, the candidates will be given two and a half minutes for closing remarks. This event will end promptly at 8.30. Welcome again to all people watching us through Zoom and on Facebook Live. Thank you to our candidates for their dedication to serving the North Island. With no further ado, please meet our candidates. From the Liberal Party, Norm Facey. Thank you, Norm. Thank you, Eric. I'd like to begin by offering my thanks to the Port McNeil Chamber of Commerce and the Election 2020 Working Group for hosting this meeting. 
for myself, my family's been part of the North Island community for generations. My grandfather logged the Sayward Plateau on a steam donkey. My dad's entire career was spent in the BC coast, first as a faller, then a scaler, and finally a booming ground operator. I started my dad's knee riding water taxis up and down the coast, looking at booms, then working under mills, finally becoming a boom man in the family business. Dad pretty well disowned me when I went in for an engineering degree, but reclaimed me when I joined McMullen Bodell and Paw River. Enjoyed a career that took me across the country, coming back to the coast in executive positions in the forestry industry. Somewhere in there, my wife and I found time to raise a family and build a sailboat, which we then sailed around the world on. That adventure showed us that without a doubt, there are a few places in the world with a better combination of security, support, and opportunity than beautiful BC. I'm going to skip a little bit into our platform because I don't think we're going to fit in it too many other times. Um, the BC Liberals are going to build opportunity in BC with more money in your pocket to create jobs and invest in every part of the province. We'll do that by eliminating the PST for a year and then reducing it to 3% in the second year. We'll also eliminate small business tax entirely because they're going to need help in, in the near future. Child care must not be a bearer for parents, especially trying to get back into the economy. So we are subsidized child care for low income and middle income families, including $10 a day child care for low income British Columbians. It will step up to um, $30 a day for moderate income. And if you're over, I think it was $150, uh, $105,000, well, we believe you can afford it. Big deal is we'll make sure that it's available for everyone who wants it. We'll provide better, more dignified seniors care for our parents and our grandparents with an additional billion dollar investment over five years, in long-term care facilities and the rebuilding of long-term care facilities. We'll reduce the ICBC monopoly, give you options. We'll provide a real pathway to get people off drugs and ensure safer streets and communities with increased funding for public safety, improved hiring of officers and approved hiring of mental health professionals. And we will put eight more billion dollars into infrastructure improvements over three years for the biggest infrastructure investment in BC history with a total investment of 30.9 billion over three years. And that's all meant to stimulate the economy and get people back to work. The person we send down to Island to Victoria is going to be someone you can trust to advocate for you in your interview. Our MLA needs to understand this large community and share our values. It's their job. I'm ready to make sure, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Norm. From the new Democratic Party, Michelle Babchuk. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. And first, I'd like to no acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the traditional territory of the Wewakum, Wewakai, and the Lakota speaking people. And I'd also like to thank the organizers for this forum tonight, the Port McNeil and District Chamber of Commerce. I'd just like to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Michelle Babchuk. I'm your BC NDP candidate in the North Island. I moved here from Kitimat with my husband and two children. And our first night in our house in Campbell River was December 31st, 1999. I've been passionate about provincial politics for a long time especially around public education, healthcare, housing, connectivity, forestry, and the environment. It's been a privilege serving my community for the past 15 years, um, and I want to continue working hard for the people of the North Island. I was elected to the School District 72 Board of Education in 2005 after I and other parents rallied against school closures. And then after three terms in 2014, with the support of my community, I was elected to the city of Campbell River as a councillor. I was appointed to the Strathcona Regional District uh, and that's a, where I serve currently as the chair. And I'm asking you on October 24th to exercise your right to vote. I'm Michelle Babchuk and I'm asking for your support. Thank you, Michelle. From the Conservative Party of British Columbia, John Twigg. Thank you, Eric. Um, and I too will recognize uh, that you're on the traditional territories of the Kwakwakwak people, and uh, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, 
there are several reasons I'm running again uh, to try to be MLA for North Island. This is my third attempt. Uh, but uh, the most important to me is to promote the idea that British Columbia should begin now to develop self-sufficiency strategies in many key areas of our economy and society. It is increasingly obvious that the world is heading towards a horrific World War III, uh, which could kill a lot of people. And uh, what BC can do uh, to help people survive that is to become more self-sufficient in food and water, and policing and security, banking and money, and uh, housing and energy, and uh, many other things like that. But uh, there's many other issues, of course, that voters are involved in, and I look forward to discussing those as the evening goes along. Um, I should note that uh, I'm running for the Conservative Party of BC, as you correctly pointed out, Eric, uh, sometimes known as the BC Conservatives. Uh, we are not connected to the Conservative Party of Canada, though, of course, uh, uh, we do uh, share a lot of values. We have uh, respect uh, for free enterprise, freedom, civil rights, economic development, uh, job creation, and family values. Uh, if I was elected, I would give the people of North Island a strong voice and a force in Victoria, uh, especially for people and businesses and First Nations and local governments. Uh, I do support protecting the environment, but I also want to grow the economy and uh, increase and spread uh, a new level of prosperity. I believe in the environment and the economy. Uh, we have a platform. Uh, we have uh, policies coming out. Uh, I certainly think that uh, recovering from the, the COVID damage to the economy is going to be very important in the uh, times ahead. Uh, but we also need... Uh, better, uh, effective, responsible government in Victoria. And regardless of which party wins the election, it probably won't be us because we're only running 19 candidates. But uh, I will work with whoever is elected. I have a lot of experience in politics going all the way back to 1972 as a financial editor in Saskatchewan, an independent member of the press gallery for about 20 years. And I've been a resident lifelong of Vancouver Island. I was up here at age three months when I was born 71 years ago in Campbell River. And I visited all the areas of the island. Actually, not totally all of the uh, constituency of North Island yet, but uh, I'm certainly familiar with uh, a lot of uh, the geography and the industry and uh, the systems of government. And I've got a pretty good idea of things that need to be improved, but I'm uh, Welcome, uh, open-minded to get more suggestions from situations, events like tonight, and in the times ahead. If I was to be elected MLA, which I have to admit is a I think John's run over his allotted time and our referee has captured that. Um, from the BC Green Party, Alexandra Morton. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you. I'm very proud to live in the territory of the Numgees First Nation. I lived in Echo Bay for 26 years where I raised my children. And there I learned about the impact that provincial policies can have on small rural communities. Since 2009, I've lived on Malcolm Island, and so I do understand we've, what we face on the North Island. I'm a fisherman, a scientist, a writer, and I've spent 30 years trying to protect wild salmon. I don't give up. We on the North Island, the North North Island, are a diverse, hardy, and independent group. And in my view, we're overlooked. Even though the lands and the waters around us are used heavily, to make distant uh, communities richer. You're probably wondering why I would shift my attention from protecting wild salmon to running for MLA. And the reason is that I can see we are never going to save wild salmon until our communities are able to thrive without destroying the world around us. So specifically, this means we need to get as many jobs as possible from every tree that is cut. Forest tenures have to be redistributed to include the First Nations whose territories they're in, and to local communities. 
We can no longer stand by and allow wild salmon runs to be destroyed. They built the soil of this province. They built the First Nation cultures. They fed us newcomers and they built boats, homes, and cities. Are we really gonna tell our children that too bad we, we didn't leave any for you? So I promise you, we do not have to lose these fish. We need roads, we need bigger ferries on a consistent basis, we need high-speed internet, more housing, better social systems for the young and the very old and in between, and we really need local food security. I believe governments that are diverse and that in this case have a green rudder is important as we face the unprecedented challenges of COVID and climate change. We learned in the early months of COVID that small businesses are the champion job creators and thus they really do deserve our care and attention. I will operate a constituency office in the North North Island in the Mount Waddington district and I will listen closely, I will listen closely to you and facilitate the initiatives that you need to thrive. And uh, I'm very proud of my community for the set of questions that came at us. You, uh, you certainly got me thinking. So thanks very much. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, this starts our question period. The first question comes from my neighbor, uh, the Port McNeil Mayor, Gabby Wickstrom. The North Island MLA has historically been from the Strathcona Regional District. Many of the people who live within the regional district of Mount Waddington have the opinion that our MLA may not be adequately informed of the issues and challenges facing the residents of this part of the North Island. Who specifically in the region are your advisors in all matters related to local politics, forest policy, provincial and marine tenure, indigenous relations, social services, health, transportation? You have one minute to answer this question. Michelle, you will lead off. Thank you very much for the question uh, from your worship, Mayor Gabby Wickstrom. And I would just like to take this opportunity to congratulate her on her recent election to the UBCM executive. Uh, congratulations. Um, I don't believe in key advisors. I believe that the whole communities need to be recognized and uh, consulted. So I will be uh, connecting with uh, locally elected leaders, industry leaders, service providers, and of course the constituents themselves that are having issues with whatever platform piece that they're, they're looking at. Um, of course, there will be people in the communities that have expertise in these areas, but I do believe, and I think uh, Mayor Wickstrom will agree with me, you can put a bunch of locally elected people in the room and come out with 15 different answers. So um, if, uh, if you can't grasp the whole scope of the issue, then you're not doing anybody any service. So I wouldn't have key advisors. I'd be uh, being advised by all of the constituents and uh, service providers leadership in the North Island. Thank you, Michelle. John? Um, I monitor the media constantly. And so I read the Times Colonist every day. I, I get a fair diet of the news uh, that way for the whole region. Uh, I also, of course, read the, the Campbell River Mirror. Uh, I sometimes see the North Island Gazette. Uh, but as a journalist uh, for lifelong, really, uh, I also uh, am comfortable reaching out to people when I need to get issues, uh, and learn about issues. And I'm also happy to take calls. I got a couple today, actually, from uh, people. Uh, there was one fellow in uh, uh, Port Alice concerned about the road there and uh, yeah I'm open to uh, input and when I need information I'm well able to go out and get it. I agree with Alexandra's idea I think it was Alexandra about uh, opening a constituency office in the north region uh, that makes sense. Uh, during the last election when I campaigned um, I got a feel for the layout of the uh, the different communities there. And uh, I haven't been to Cape Scott yet. I'd love to go. But uh, yeah. Thanks very much, John. Uh, Alex? I, I have to agree with the previous two. You really do have to talk to everybody. 
uh, elected First Nations, hereditary leaders, members, loggers, fishermen. I do monitor Facebook. Um, the community pages are really where issues come up about ferries and gardens and um, leadership and uh, housing shortages and how to solve them. So that's been an important part of uh, my learning. Uh, and just uh, talking to everybody. That is really the only way you can do this because if you, if you go to one head of one sector, you really don't get the full depth of what is going on here and you really can't figure out what needs to you know, be done to correct the situations. Thank you, Alex, Norm. Thank you. Well, I think you've got total alignment. I too believe in boots on the ground and would, when I'm not in session, um, be traveling on a routine basis. My goal would be get to every corner of the, the riding um, and to actively listen and then feedback what I am hearing. But uh, definitely get out there, get on the ground, listen to people. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. For what it's worth, Gabby also gave you the answer to that question and you all got it right. So well done. <laughs> uh, I think I've been unmuted, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm, I apologize for going over time. It's my first time on this technology and I don't see a clock. No problem, John. Uh, we, uh, you know, Port McNeil is, um, is managing with limited resources and, uh, and uh, the next time I'll put the clock behind me. <laughs> <laughs> this question is from the board of the Port McNeil Chamber of Commerce. For the people employed in the regional district of Mount Waddington, Statistics Canada shows a high medium wage per capita of the highest in fact in rural BC. Yet the 2019 child poverty report indicates that we have the second highest child poverty rates in the province behind the Central Coast Regional District and 67% of single parents in the region live in poverty. Why do you feel this is the case and what would you do to repair this disparity during your first term of office? You have two minutes to answer this question, starting with you, John. <laughs> yeah. Um... The industry base, the industrial base, obviously contributes to high wages, but the structure of the region with its spread out uh, communities uh, means that there's not a lot of job opportunities for non-resource workers. So you can see that child poverty is going to be kicking in. And uh, I think there's probably a First, Nation, First Nations element in those statistics as well. Um, and what would I do about it? Well, it's actually a province-wide problem and uh, it's clearly got to be addressed. Uh, direct aid, more social workers, and I would think especially job creation. And we can do partnerships with the private sector to get more jobs going. But uh, the experience in a lot of places shows that uh, one of the best ways to solve social problems is to create jobs. I'll leave it there. Thanks, John. Alex? I, I didn't, wasn't aware of this figure and found it very shocking, but clearly it's related to uh, how the resources are allocated. There has to be much fairer allocation of resources, as I said in my opening, um, definitely to First Nations uh, have resources in their territory and also community-based. I think single mothers need to be supported. Um, raising children has to be seen as a job, a very, very important job. And um, oh, it, really, we can do better than this. To have these two polarized figures, um, it's, it's shameful. And so there's going to have to be some equity that, uh, that happens here. And, I think in the end, everybody will feel better about that. I hope so anyway. Thank you, Alex. Norm? <clears throat> this was an interesting question and truly complicated one that goes into so many areas. It's far beyond basic uh, employment availability or access. It appears to be interge intergenerational. There's literacy, nutrition. Um, I can't claim to have a total comprehension. 
but I was relieved to learn Port Hardy has a designated poverty reduction counselor. Um, it's funded well. And I believe that the North Island would benefit from a poverty reduction strategy similar to those employed in the South Island. Thank you. Thanks, Norm. Michelle? Yeah, thank you very much. And these, uh, these statistics are, uh, are alarming. Um, but what that really tells me is that you have some industry that has good incomes, but you also have uh, a really high cost of living. And, you know, just an example of that, I was up there last week and your gas prices up there are at least 10 cents a litre more than what we're paying down island. But we do have, a, we do have some uh, mechanisms in place. Uh, we have uh, cancelled some of the liberal tax cuts that were being given to the wealthiest people in our province. Uh, we've eliminated MSP and bridge tolls. And we have now implemented uh, or will be implementing on October 1st, the Child Opportunity Benefit, which gives up to $2,600 a year for families with two kids. Uh, we've had our first hydro reduction in decades, down 1% in 2020. Uh, we re reduced childcare fees and uh, reducing ICBC rates by 20% starting next year. Uh, of course, that the Liberals have come out and said that they will cancel. Uh, we are also providing a one-time $1,000 direct deposit uh, to families whose households are under $125,000 or a 500 for single people learning, earning less than $62,000. We're freezing rents at the end of 2020 till the end of 2021 and capping rent east increases uh, there and after that and providing a $400 a year rental rebate um, for households under $80,000. So I believe that all of these together are going to really assist the people that are living in uh, those poverty levels and uh, help the North Island. Thank you, Michelle. You know, I, I just want to take a moment to say I appreciate that some of these questions are not easy. And they're designed to not just give the residents of the North Island the ability to make an informed decision. They're also designed to make you aware of what's happening right now on the North Island. And uh, I would also like to say that as we move through this uh, discussion and this debate, I am uh, reserving the right to direct the candidates to uh, keep their answers on point. Thank you. Question number three. This question comes from the Regional District of Mount Waddington Area C Representative James Fernie. On November 28, 2019, the British, the British Columbia Provincial Government enacted into law the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, also known as UNDRA. A common theme being heard on the North Island from Indigenous government and business, as well as resource businesses and municipalities, is that the province has not provided business, community, and local Indigenous government with the tools or resources to safely and appropriately bridge from one reality to another. Can you suggest a mechanism that will preserve the fundamentals of UNDRIP while preserving community stability, employment, and invested capital? You have two minutes to answer this question. Alex, please lead us off. Planning is the most important mechanism um, to, to deal with UNDRIP. Uh, and in the process of doing these plans, of building these plans, the province has to show good faith by taking some steps immediately at the outset of the process to show that they intend to follow through. The tools of delaying just have to be removed from the provincial toolbox. And the non-Indigenous have to be educated that First Nations are unlikely to turn around and behave badly if given resources. And you just need to look at the, um, the huge First Nation determined projects on the Kokish, uh, which brought $250 million in construction jobs, and also Orca Sand and Gravel, which is also happening under the uh, auspices of First Nations and is contributing millions into the North Island economy and wages. So 
planning and going forward in good faith are key to following through with UNDRIP. Thank you, Alex. Nora? Thank you. Regarding all industry right now, agriculture is probably a great example of UNDRIP and the results of working together if we continue to build on the success of implementing UNDRIP in agriculture. The BC Liberals are committed to addressing issues of economic and social inequality faced by all indigenous, indigenous people. And we look forward to working with our First Nations. We think you need some resources. We think we need a little bit of framework to help people get together. And uh, we would do that by uh, actively supporting the right of First Nations to negotiate for the economic benefit of their peoples with supports by the province, including renewing capacity funding. Provide funding mechanisms to enable First Nations to access affordable capital to invest in revenue generating economic opportunities. And work with Indigenous people to ensure we don't saddle future generations with unsolved issues of rights and title. We will work every single day to resolve these issues, including dragging the federal government into the table if that's what it takes. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Norm. Michelle? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, as a government, we were the first ones to implement the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, and I believe strongly in the um, process of reconciliation and self-determination. Uh, we need to partner with our Indigenous people on key decisions that affect them, providing clear, stable, and sustainable paths for everyone to work forward. But I, be I believe we're at the first steps and we need to engage with our Indigenous people in that government to government forum that Mr. Facey uh, so graciously gave us uh, talked about before around aquaculture um, to determine what that process and mechanism is because I do not believe that it needs to be imposed by a government. It needs to be uh, built out of collaboration. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. John? I think one of the problems uh, in this issue, uh, which is a big issue, is that First Nations are seen as uh, mainly federal responsibility. And in a practical world, uh, it really should be both federal and provincial. Uh, the federal funding has clearly been inadequate. And the province, uh, as a government, has not really been aggressive in going after proper federal funding of these initiatives. That's true under the former governments and it's true under the present NDP government. Uh, how we force the feds to meet their responsibilities uh, is a real challenge. Uh, in the meantime, uh, blaming Ottawa for underfunding doesn't solve the solution. So what can be done? Uh, I tend to agree with the tenor of some of the foregoing answers about local initiatives, local job creation, but you know, creating a, a job in a not viable industry isn't really a solution. Uh, the, the lack of capital, the lack of access to markets, the, it's a very complex problem. Economic development is a tough problem no matter where you're located. And when you've got a small population on a resource-based economy in a remote location, which is what the North Island is, the very far North Island, yeah, we've got to work harder at it. If I was elected, I would certainly address that kind of an issue. Thanks, John. Question number four. This question comes from the Port McNeil Chamber of Commerce Board and the Council of the Village of Alert Bay. What is your personal and party's focus on assisting with the development and growth of tourism on the North Island? You have one minute to answer. Please lead us off, Norm. Looking at the area, um, there's three areas, three pillars of the economy for the North Island. First is forestry, aquaculture, and then tourism. Those are what drive our economy. At this point in time, tourism's on life support. Um, it's been hit heavily by COVID. Some areas done better than I was ever expecting this year through stay staycations. Um, but I would work with the term industry and municipal partners to support development of regional tourist hubs across BC, deliver emergency financing and loan guarantees for over 19,000 BC tourism and hospitality businesses, 
expand uh, measures to increase access to capital investment for new startups, implement a short-term commercial rent relief program uh, that flows relief directly to the tenants, and support small businesses unable to relieve to access current relief programs. That's on top of eliminating the small business tax. These people deserve true support if we expect them to be there after we've got COVID dealt with in some form. So we will provide that support. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Norm. Michelle? Yeah, thank you. Um, I like this question because I, I do agree that our tourism sector is having some difficulties right now. Um, but we do have uh, organizations already in place that are looking at tourism development and growth in, uh, in BC, Destination BC, Destination Vancouver Island, um, the, are just regional tourist hubs that I would be working collaboratively with to make sure that they are all in sync. Uh, and then of course we have the Island Coastal Economic Trust that does a lot of work with tourism based initiatives and funding for the North Island. So I would be working in collaboration with all of those. Um, I believe our next question deals with uh, resources for the tourism uh, sector. So I will talk about that in the next question. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. John? Yeah, um, I have a background in uh, tourism to some degree. I edited a tourism magazine in North Vancouver when I was quite young. And uh, through my other activities, uh, I've got a fair grasp on the tourism industry as a big picture. You know, it's more than getting cruise ship stops. Uh, I think if you took, if we took an inventory of, okay, what would people want to come and see and do? Uh, and then promoted that more to target markets. Uh, you know, like the, uh, the North Coast Trail, for example. Um, are we promoting that adequately? Uh, but there's got to be a lot of other things, uh, you know, like tours to fish farms. Um, I don't know. Certainly uh, getting out to Port Alice over a better road and then having uh, some things to do when you get there. Uh, you know, we're not going to get a lot of visitors just for fishing. Uh, we need uh, experiential situations, you know, like uh, watching potlatches or other First Nations ceremonies like that. That's attractive. So I'd take the inventories and then promote them. Thank you. Thanks, John. Alex? Um. The majority of tourism in the North Island is based on salmon, fishing, whales, bear watching, eagle watching. You know, unless you're going up to see the caves or, or go skiing, it, it's based on salmon. So we need to take care of these fish. I've been shocked tonight and last night that the candidates are saying that the pillars of the North Island economy is aquaculture, tourism, and forestry without mentioning wild salmon, which, you know, built the place. So if we take care of the salmon, uh, tourism will flourish uh, on its own. Thanks, Alex. Question well, number Chair, two. John Twig, could I interject one thing? I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but work more with the Campbell River Tourism Center. Uh, I should have mentioned that. Thank you. Thanks, John. Question number five. This question comes from the Port Manila Chamber of Commerce Board and membership. Uh, COVID-19 has had a devastating effect on the now failing BC tourism business, especially ecotourism. Federal and provincial government has assigned no specific economic relief for this billion dollar industry and significant source of employment. Will your party assist this industry? If so, how? Michelle, please lead us off. You have one minute. Thank you. Um, so we have developed an economic recovery plan that does have grants for small and medium sized business, a task force de dedicated to reviving BC's ailing tourism sector and funding aimed at boosting workforce rattled by record job loss uh, are among our uh, top priorities. 
So among the biggest direct spending priorities of this province is a 300 million recovery grant for small and medium sized business. Um, and it's and it's enhanced amount for operating operating sorry oper, operating tourism. Uh, a separate 50 million is being allocated to, uh, to a new tourism task force charged with boosting an industry hit harder uh, by most travel restrictions. Um, the particular funding is expected to roll out this year as a part of $100 million earmarked specifically for the tourism sector with grants for local government and tourism development initiatives on the table. We know the tourism industry was seeking 680 million in support, uh, but we do also know that the Tourism Associa uh, Industry Association of BC uh, considers this a good start and is hoping to see some more in the 2021 budget. Uh, we all understand that the tourism sector is being hard hit at this time, and we will be working uh, to, into the future to add more resources. Thank you. Thank you. John? Well, uh, my assistant here <laughs> just gave me the party's uh, policy platform, and it contains this. Article 13, Tourism. Uh, recognize tourism to be essential to the economy of British Columbia, and encouraging tourism as a major growth area. Develop appropriate measures and incentives to encourage expansion of tourism. Assist in the stimulation of tourism through international marketing in cooperation with tourism operators. I confess that's the first time I've read it, but I agree with it. Uh, my answer was going to be, and it still is, that uh, we have to do targeted promotions. Now, the question was focused on ecotourism. I happen to be somewhat familiar with that. Uh, I'd like to do more. Uh, if I had more time and money, I'd probably spend a lot of time on ecotourism. I'm a, a big fan. I wrote the first guidebook to the West Coast Trail, for example. But uh, yeah, like so many of these questions, we've only had a few yet, but they all involve, let's get informed, get a plan and act on it. And I would say that applies to ecotourism too. Thanks, John. Alex? Uh, specific to COVID and, and how to um, revive our tourism industry or, or allow it to survive, I think one of the most important thing is that each operator needs to be reviewed as to how they are responding to COVID. Because from what I'm hearing, a lot of them got very creative about how to distance people and, and keep you know the, the crew and also the visitors safe. And they are very resourceful. They really are um, an incredible group Money was offered, but it was difficult for them to take it because repayment was required and you know many just didn't feel that they could do that next year. So I think really the single greatest thing that you could do for the term, tourism industry is individually assess the steps that they are taking to deal with COVID because we know so much more about the virus now. Um, it's not quite the uh, unknown that it was at the beginning and I, I think this would help them. Thank you very much. Uh, Norm? Thank you. Looking at the, uh, the tourism, once again, it is a pillar for us. Once again, it's on life support. So once again, we will support it. Um, wiping out the PST for a year directly helps tourism. It reduces the cost of people coming in. Eliminating the small business tax will also help tourism and keep them alive. Deliver emergency funding for BC businesses hardest hit through a loan guarantee program for BC's more than 19,000 tourism and hospitality businesses. And expand measures to increase access to capital investment for tech technology sector and startups. Work with the tourist industry and municipal partners to support the development and growth of regional tourism hubs across BC to encourage local uh, tourism. And support workers in our cultural sectors, providing funding for arts and culture organizations to improve themselves in tourism. Thank you. Thanks, Norm. Question number six. This question comes from a local Indigenous business owner and Port McNeil Chamber of Commerce board member, Jamuga. 
On the North Island, we believe that a rising tide floats all boats and equity, equity is the cornerstone to growth. What will your party do to promote equitable entrepreneurship opportunities within Indigenous communities? You have one minute to answer this question. John, please lead us off. Well, uh, off the top of my head, uh, what would I do to help promote uh, Indigenous businesses? Uh, well, first of all, let's talk to the individual businesses and see what they want. Um, and then find, well, what could be potential solutions. Access to capital is a theme that runs through all of these questions and issues. And, uh, you know, my, I mentioned uh, last night uh, restarting the Bank of BC as a, as a currency issuing institution. Uh, you know, finding new funding for needed developments is a real challenge. And uh, running to Ottawa is, uh, you know, it, it doesn't work it, as well as it should. Uh, depending on Victoria, uh, depends on how the budgets are going. And when the Liberals were in power, there was uh, always seemed to be money for their friends, but not necessarily for needed projects like this. So once again, uh, I'd be happy to communicate, take an inventory, and then promote. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, Alex? Well, I agree with John on uh, talking to the people who want to begin these businesses. I think that is obviously very important uh, and to really listen to what they need. But also, as I keep saying, there has to be uh, a fair um, access to the resources. I say it again, the loss of wild salmon has destroyed so many jobs in Alert Bay uh, and the surrounding First Nation communities and others. Uh, from fishing to processing. Um, so those, those would be the, the greatest things, restore the wild salmon, talk to the businesses, and uh, there has to be access to the forests uh, for these nations. Thanks, Alex. Norm? Thank you, Rick. Um, I, I think fish farms are a great example of what could be done. Um, 21st Nations have partnership agreements with farming salmon in their territory. 70% of all the salmon farmed in the provinces is under beneficial partnership with the First Nation. And about 20% of salmon farming jobs are held by people of First Nation heritage. Every new farm proposed in the decade, last decade, has been in partnership with First Nations. What the BC Liberals would specifically do is provide financing mechanisms to enable First Nations to access affordable capital to invest in revenue generating economic opportunities, prioritize sector specific job training opportunities for indigenous people, and actively support the right of First Nations to negotiate for economic benefit of their peoples with additional supports from the province, again, reinstituting capacity funding. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Norm. Michelle? Yeah, I think this is a great question because I think this goes back to the philosophical piece on whether, um, you know, we are individuals or whether we are one. And I believe that all entrepreneurial opportunities for people should be given the same credence. So um, with the fact that we have our Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, I believe that those government to government processes are going to be key to moving forward. And our First Nations partners need to be just that, partners, not consulted with, but partners. So then we'll be able to take a look at those equitable opportunities across the board. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Question seven. This question comes from Nemo Bay owner and co-founder Craig Murray. Fish farming has been a contentious issue on the North Island for many years. Some support it, while many do not. Will your party renew the leases for fish farms in the Broughton Archipelago and in the Discovery Islands? You have 30 seconds to answer this question, but I'm accepting a yes or a no uh, just as well. Alex? Renewal of fish farm tenures in the Broughton Archipelago and the Discovery Islands now in the hands of First Nations. However, I believe that the extreme low Fraser River sockeye numbers, the province should withdraw the tenures 
in the Discovery Islands for the good of all British Columbians and particularly Fraser River First Nations. And then I would consult with the Discovery Islands First Nations on how to compensate them for the loss of the salmon farms. Thank you. Norm? BC Liberals support science-based aquaculture. I have great respect for the skills and approach of the professional DFO biologists and appreciate their clear call on this question and await the results of consultations um, as are in process for uh, the discovery in the Broughton Archipelago, Archipelago. The First Nations continue Indigenous Monitoring and Inspection Plan will establish oversight of the fish farm for operating this area over the next four years. And we would operate, uh, observe that process. Thank you, Norm. Michelle? The John Horgan government led the work um, to fix that big bar slide, which devastated the upper Fraser Sound stocks. Uh, and when concerns were raised in the Broughton Archipelago, the Horgan government acted and worked with First Nations to come up with recommendations to address long-standing concerns uh, uh, around wild salmon and implemented the government-to-government -government process, which has wildly been hailed by all involved as successful and a process that should be replicated. And we could replicate it in the Discovery Islands. Uh, the John Horgan government also brought in the new coastal-wide aquaculture policy that states by 2022, tenure for fish farms will not be renewed without the agreement of First Nations and the approval of DFO that they won't risk wild salmon. I am a huge wild salmon advocate. The new aquaculture policy and our Salmon Restoration Innovation Fund, which is a $142.8 million fund in cooperation with the federal government, are just two ways that we're taking real action to protect the habitat and restore our wild salmon stocks. Thanks. As your MLA, I will continue to work on this. Thank you. John? Well, I have a neighbor here in Campbell River who works on a fish farm in the Broughton Archipelago. And uh, that and me being a business journalist, I understand how important the fish farm industry is in the economy of not just North Island, but British Columbia. Uh, Campbell River is home to the head offices, regional offices, I guess, of quite a few fish farm companies. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say, well, we've got to shut down all the fish farms. No, uh, like in our debate last night, uh, it's, you know, let's take a common sense approach. Let's deal with this. Let's study it. Let's talk about it. Uh, obviously, uh, managing the farms better so that when the migrating fish are passing by, uh, there's, you know, less sea lice, that kind of stuff. We can do the industry smarter too, but shutting it down, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's not an option anymore. Thank you, John. Question number eight. This question comes from United Steelworker Local 1-1937 President Brian Butler. During the USW strike against WFP, the company, opposition parties, and some members of the public were calling for the government to intervene and legislate workers back to work or have a cooling off period. This was opposed by the USW what would be the position you would advocate for in that situation? You have one minute to answer this question. Norm, please lead us off. Thank you very much for the question. That strike didn't help either party. It hurt the North Island communities. It hurt North Island part, uh, families. And it went on way too long. So very definitely, I would have supported intervention. Government taking no action was not a normal practice, especially for so long an impasse that impacted too many families. I mean, we're talking about proud loggers having to go to uh, food banks to support their family. We're talking about people that are on the verge of losing their homes. This was extreme conditions. So I would have supported in interfacing to um, break the stair between the two, to cool them down. Legislation would be an absolute last resort, but we needed to be involved. Thank you. Thanks, Nora. Michelle? 
Yeah, I too will recognize that, you know, in our communities, we were either directly affected or knew someone uh, very close to us that was affected. And this was a devastating strike. And I recognize it was hard on a lot of North Island families. Um, I believe that the John Horgan government recognized this as well. And that's why he appointed the special mediators and gave them special powers to try and find resolution in this. He also provided $5 million of funding to assist with bridge financing uh, for contractors. But I also believe that strong, long-lasting agreements happen at the bargaining table, free from political interference. And I believe in the right to free collective bargaining. So I am very glad that the process did finally resolve and that the two contributing parties uh, came to agreement and that uh, coastal forest workers and their families are back on the job. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. John? Yeah, um, a strike where nobody wins. Uh, we've seen a lot of those over the decades in BC. Um, I confess I'm not an expert in that particular dispute. I obviously read about it. I certainly remember it. What I would have done differently, uh, I can't say. Uh, I agree with uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Michelle about, uh, you know, the government did, the provincial government did send in help to negotiate a better solution. Uh, there may be structural issues that we got to deal with too. I think it's kind of ironic that uh, Mr. Facey's uh, commenting about that, uh, given his uh, history at Elk Falls. Uh, he shut it down, I think. I don't know if he was the last manager, but uh, BC has had far too many situations where industry and labor are at each other's throats and they choke each other to death. Thanks, John. Alex? Well, in general, government should stay out of labor disputes as these collective agreements are between companies and unions. However, it is always preferable to have an early cooling off period before things derail. When a strike goes on as long as that one did, the behavior of the union and the company was questionable. Um, it crippled parts of the economy of this province. And so I believe, you know, at that point, government has to step in. So that would be my answer. Thank you, Alex. This question was submitted by Andrea Craddock. The pandemic has increased the challenges faced by teachers and support staff to provide safe quality education to the students of our province. What are you and your party prepared to do to increase safety for students, families and staff in our public schools, including support for students with special needs? You have one minute to answer this question. We're gonna start with you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I like this question because we are able to have a conversation about the person in our, in, in our society right now who is leading us through the COVID-19 and that's Dr. Bonnie Henry. Uh, she's a fantastic spokesperson for the COVID-19 and our, and our pandemic relief. And with her assistance, um, M Minister Fleming introduced a back to school plan that helps keep our students safe while giving them the opportunity to continue their studies in front of an educator. And we've done that by, you know, new ventilating systems, plexiglass barriers, comprehensive cleaning, and more cleaning in schools. And also with collaboration with the British Columbia Teachers Federation, also CUPE, who does a lot of the, um, the uh, extra work with special needs and uh, a lot of the janitorial. Uh, and I just think we need to continue those open dialogues to make sure that our children have exactly what they need. I know that parents in the school districts in the North Island have big concerns about the safety of their children, but I also know that they have big concerns that their education needs to move forward. So thank you. Thanks, Michelle. John? Yeah, kind of both sides of the fence. Um, Andrea Craddock, uh, I recognize as one of the union activists in uh, Campbell River here, probably for the region. Uh, the safety of teachers with so many students in this time of COVID uh, obviously has to be a concern. But uh, 
the, from what we've seen so far, it looks like it's been reasonably well managed. There was one case here in Campbell River so far of a student coming down with COVID and you, we could say only one and let's pray that it remains only one. Um, I, I guess I sympathize with teachers being concerned about their own safety, but uh, I think the importance of education to so many kids is probably bigger than the concerns about one teacher. Uh, perhaps, I'm probably not gonna get many teachers union votes anyway, but I'm, I'm in favor of having the schools back in school. And if the situation worsens, well then, okay, let's take a second look. Thank you. Thanks very much. Alex? The teachers I talk to are terrified and they don't understand because Dr. Bonnie Henry is saying, mask up, stay in your house, socially isolate, keep a distance. And yet these teachers are in classrooms with 30, 40 children during the smoke that we had, uh, they couldn't open the windows. They're not seeing any ventilation uh, adaptions to their school rooms. They just have a bottle of Oxifer uh, and that's supposed to protect them. So they understand the need and they're there, uh, but they are scared for their health and their lives. And so they want masks on the children. They want the COVID alert system that is happening in other provinces. They want transparency. They would like to know a little bit more about the situation with the infection. Um, there's other schools where there's been multiple infections, but no outbreak has been called. And so they really don't understand and feel a little bit like the economy is being put forward ahead of lives because we need the kids in school to get the families to work. So, but the teachers were very reasonable. They, they knew what they wanted and, and I hope that they can get it. And I certainly would work towards making that happen for them. Thanks, Norm. Thank you. Um, I mean, and this is, as others have uh, reflected on, this is a huge risk versus educational lag. I mean, how do you balance the two? Um, and, and I'm fortunate enough to have a son-in-law who's a teacher and very concerned about his family and his, my only grandchild, um, but he's there. And uh, he hasn't seen any improvements in the school, in the ventilation system or plexiglass shields. So I think we all, all four parties support bon, Bonnie Henry and the work that she's done. And I think in this instance, we probably need to follow through on those recommendations a little stronger. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is submitted by Lois Jarvis and seconded by the Council of the Village of Alert Bay. The Campbell River Hospital Lab serves all of North Island. Services and funding have been taken from the Campbell River Hospital Lab and given up to a private for-profit corporation in Victoria. This has rendered the Campbell River Lab dysfunctional and unsustainable and has been harmful to patients. What are you going to do to restore service levels and funding? You have 30 seconds to answer the question. John. Yeah, I happen to be familiar with this uh, issue. Uh, I'm part of the uh, Citizens for Quality Healthcare in Campbell River here. Not a big active on the board leader, but uh, I, I, I turn out to their meetings. Uh, Lois sends me uh, background documents and I appreciate that. Uh, it looks like we could call this a special case. There's uh, some professionals in Victoria who lobbied VHA to get a contract that was being done here in Campbell River. And uh, maybe it's done cheaper in Victoria, but the service to the locals is worse. I say bring back the contract to Campbell River. Thank you. Alex? I agree, we need to bring that contract back. Um, healthcare is already marginal in the North Island. Our doctors never stay for very long. Um, and uh, giving this uh, pathology position to a corporation in Victoria uh, really, really smells bad. And when 75 doctors in a community tell us this is wrong, we really do need to listen. I mean, do any of us want to delay in a diagnosis of a malignancy? And that's what we're dealing with, so. I would bring that job back. 
Thanks, Alex. Norm? Well, my gut reaction is having those services in Campbell River is an advantage, uh, simpler line of communication, simpler line of transportation. What I'd be interested in hearing is the turnaround time and to a lesser degree, the comparative cost of services. If the turnaround time is faster, it could be a good call. Okay. Thanks, Norm. Thank Michelle? So I've stated several times that I'm a huge advocate for publicly funded, fully accessible health care. And I just want to thank uh, the Citizens for Quality Health Care for their advocacy on this, uh, on this uh, service. And uh, I believe that the service levels need to be advocated for at our North Island hospitals. And I also believe in having those services in-house. So um, I will be advocating uh, to keep those service levels at our North Island hospitals uh, as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to uh, adjust the order of questions somewhat, uh, just recognizing the passage of time. Um, we're going to move on to uh, question 13. This question comes from the PMCC member and owner of ShopRite Stores, Peter Rossback. Prioritize what you think are the top issues that are and will be faced by North Islanders in the next four years. You have one minute to answer this question. Uh, I apologize for changing the order of, of answering, but Michelle, please lead us off. Thank you. Um, I actually have a few, but if I had to pick my top three at this point, uh, the revival of the resource sector would certainly be up there. Uh, our wild salmon stocks would be there. I think addressing our mental health and addictions issues in our communities certainly needs to be looked at. And uh, for our North Island, affordability. Thank you. John? <laughs> uh, thank you, Michelle, for giving me a good list. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say the most important issue is the business climate and the job creation in the private sector, uh, both for resource industries and small businesses. Uh, there are so many other issues though. Uh, uh, the mental health and addictions thing, I would say is very important. Uh, you know, we saw this arson at the uh, Walmart store. I think that's drug related. It hasn't been proved yet, but uh, We've got to make the business climate better, and that includes taxation. Uh, uh, the total wipeout of the sales tax by the, that the Liberals are promising, I think, is uh, conscionable. They're wiping out the sales tax on luxuries, too. But, uh, yeah, let's do tax reform. Let's do business stimulus. Uh, let's get uh, the economy going. Thank you. Thanks. Alex? Housing, health care roads for most west coast communities connectivity and yeah let's bring the salmon back and and uh, restore the economy up north thank you norm top issues next four years economy economy and economy <laughs> um forestry economy aquaculture economy tourism economy if we don't have those we can't float everything else we won't be raising the waters we need those in order to have vibrant communities on the North Coast. We need those to buy all the other services we need. If we lose the economy, then we're all into survival mode. So I think we need to focus on that. Thank, Thank you, Norm. Thanks. Question 14. This question comes from Carl Sweet, director of the BC Forest Alliance. As possibly the next representative of our North Island riding, Will you support legislation that will designate and protect the working forest? You have 30 seconds to answer this question. Michelle? I need five seconds. Yes. <laughs> John? Uh, me too. Yes. Alex? I would not designate the entire forest as a working forest. Do you want to qualify your answer further? I believe the resource industry should become more integrated with the local economy. Um, having it stratified uh, where you have government and then these large companies, then the contractors and then the logger, there's just too much profits going to shareholders that aren't on the North Island. And so uh, this effort would make 
more jobs per fallen tree. Um, a percentage has to be reallocated back to First Nations and communities, managed forests, value added, needs sawmills. Um, and, and that's the answer. Thank you. Norm? 100% yes. We will introduce legislation to protect the working forest to increase certainty on the land base while protecting and enhancing environmentalist values. Implement a more efficient, effective, and responsive market pricing stumpage system to help keep our industry competitive and work with industry to modernize forest management practice and ensure BC's forest industry is no longer the highest cost producer in North America. This is a key issue for the North Island in this election. Thank you. Thank you. From the Port Neal Chamber of Commerce Board, uh, please summarize where you stand on the PST debate. Is a one year moratorium uh, election pandering or will it have a positive effect that is capable of moving the dial in our economy? You have 30 seconds to answer the question. Um, starting with you, John. Yeah, I'm not very good at hitting that 30, Mr. Chair, and I'm sorry about that. Um, the one-year moratorium on the sales tax blanket, I think, is dysfunctional. We should be uh, uh, removing it selectively. Uh, removing it from luxuries, I think, is, uh, well, it's counterproductive. But uh, removing it from, say, businesses that are marginal, and they need help, yes, I'd go along with that. Alex? I think a moratorium on the PSD is over, over and is election pandering. Uh, although substantial, uh, it's probably not enough to move the dial and more importantly, it will shrink provincial coffers at a time when we can sorely afford to lose revenues required for the pandemic require, uh, recovery. Thank you. Norm? Well, obviously, I don't think it's pandering. I think it's a stimulus. I think it will move the economy forward at a time when it needs to be moved. And um, it is supported by the BC Business Council and the BC Chamber of Commerce. A, a second point would be that the NDP offer of $1,000 of your own money in your back pocket um, actually costs. There is no mechanism to give that money to you. So it's more than $1,000 per person and it isn't getting into your pocket. Whereas with PST, we just turn off the collection system and it costs no extra money. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. And of course, I'm gonna to totally disagree with Mr. Facey. <laughs> Surprise. And uh, just say, I, I just don't think that the uh, removal of the PST is going to do what they wish it to do. Uh, it's not going to give the people that need it uh, the opportunity uh, to benefit from it. There's no PST on rent. There's no PST on groceries. It's only going to help out the people that have a lot of money to spend that are going to save on the PST. But I do believe that the $1,000 direct deposit to families will it puts money into their pockets to put it out into the community. And that's how the economy will become uh, spurred. And I believe that that will be the effective way. Thank you. Thank you. Question 16. This comes from longtime North Island resident and forestry worker, Doug Blatherwick. Policy changes in resource management have impacts that are often felt and understood at the grassroots community level first. How do you see yourself representing the interest of the people invested in the community when decisions made elsewhere by individuals with no local ties or vested interest come home to roost in our town? You have one minute to answer. Please start uh, this off, Alex. Well, I live in these towns. And so um, representing the interests and needs would come naturally. Uh, through speaking to everyone that is involved. Uh, I agree that, um, that uh, people elsewhere are making decisions that have affected us. I've seen that happen firsthand a number of times. So I think it's really important that the North North Island have a representative that they can speak to who will deliver their messages. 
Thank you. Norm? This is a key, key issue. Alexander and I have different ideologies, um, but we're both open and honest about stating them. It makes me mad when I think about a suit in downtown Toronto, Vancouver, and the legislatures in Ottawa and Victoria making decisions without consulting the, the roots of the business. Um, I have a pretty decent understanding of the coastal industry. It doesn't mean that I shouldn't ensure I consult with Kofi, TLA, First Nations, the communities before ever supporting or opposing changes in policies. Our communities are resource, job-based, independent. I would fight to ensure growth in our benefits from that. We need to be honest here. Um, I have my party support to ensure a healthy forest sector without any side pressure. I don't think that Michelle can say the same. Given that NDP cabinet minister George Hyman of the Sierra Club or Nikki Sharma from Stand Earth, both key people in those organizations, are now prominent in the NDPs, or at least they will be if they get in, in pretty sure writings. Worse than absence were the NDP um, through the last year. A group of loud but peaceful North Island residents rallied down to Victoria and parked in front of Parliament. The Thank you, Norm. My apologies. We're running out of time. Uh, Michelle? Thank you, Eric. And I'm very proud to be part of a party who allows their caucus to make decisions and have those hard uh, discussions uh, before policy is made. And as a locally elected official currently, I know how important it is to be able to consult with the grassroots to be able to get some of those decisions make uh, decisions right. If we do not consult with the grassroots, the local leaders, the environmental stakeholders, the First Nations, when we're changing policy, then that's when we end up going back again and again and again, trying to get it right. So I am committing to work at, in that grassroots environment uh, as your MLA moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. John? Yeah, British Columbia has a long history of decision-making from uh, interests far away, starting when we were a colony run out of London. And uh, in a way, not much has changed. Uh, we're a branch plant economy of corporations located not in Vancouver. Though, yes, we are getting a few more head offices in Vancouver. Um, resource policies in general, uh, I think it's probably time for another relook. Uh, our economy in BC is heavily dependent on resources. I think we should be getting better value out of them. Uh, but let's open it up and talk about it rather than leap. We, before we look. Thank you. I'm going to move on to question 18. The Swanson occupation demonstrated the impasse between the fish farming industry and First Nations rights and title. Answering under the premise that all of us in this conversation respect rights and title and using this scale of conflict as an example of what may occur in the region how do you plan to facilitate the dialogue and relationship between parties in intensive conflicts of per provincial jurisdiction and remain accessible and open to all your constituents' needs? Please reduce your answer to 30 seconds. Michelle? So thank you very much for the question. I believe that I answered this before when we were talking about the Broughton Archipelago uh, Agreement because I do believe that those government to government conversations are what we need to move forward in all of our resource sectors when everybody is at the table and everybody is having input on how to, uh, on how to resolve an issue, that's when we get to move forward. And that's when those conflicts are, uh, are resolved because nobody is feeling left out or alienated from the process. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah, uh, how help dialogue? I think that's the gist of the question. Uh, and the essence of First Nation rights and title versus private and uh, provincial interests. Uh, I don't have a magic wand on that, uh, but uh, I think uh, experience has shown that 
uh, you don't get solutions unless you're talking. So uh, yeah, let's set up some forums where we can negotiate uh, trade information with respect and uh, perhaps involve third parties too so that we can come to a good answer. Thank you. Thanks, John. Alex? The Swanson occupation happened after 30 years of First Nations saying, please get those salmon farms out. And at that point that they finally started occupying the farms, it was because they didn't have any salmon. They didn't have any salmon in their freezers or in their jars. So you gotta deal with these problems long before they boil over. You have to show respect when people say, you are trampling us, we don't want this. So that's the key. You, you've got to, don't, don't let it go that far. Thank you, Alex. Norm? We would work with the indigenous people to ensure we don't saddle future generations with unsolved issues of rights and title. And we'll work every day to resolve those issues. We'll work to clearly define how the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People relates to land use decisions and existing case law regarding the, uh, the title held by Indigenous people and the right to self-determination. Thank you. Thank you. So that ends our question period. It's amazing how fast that time passed. There's only 50 more questions that I was hoping to get to. Um, uh, send, send them along by email. Yes, we will actually. And if you do have time to respond to them, as I said, we'll post them on the, uh, on the chamber site. So um, the order of closing remarks uh, will be uh, starting off with, um, I believe I committed to two and a half minutes for closing remarks. I'm going, going to, uh, I'm going to reduce that. Uh, apologies uh, to two minutes. Um, Norm, please uh, start with the closing remarks. Well before the COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic, the people of North Island were concerned about their financial well-being. Over the past three years, all of us, homeowners, employers, families alike, have all watched our taxes creep up in the mismanagement of the NDP, 23 new or increased taxes. Worse yet, for six months, labor disputes between Western Force products, the workers, and most importantly, their families were totally ignored by the NDP government. The Force Minister and even our MLA were too busy in Victoria. So the group that I talked about before, the loud but peaceful North Island group, rallied to Victoria and parked in front of a parliament. The Premier didn't come out. The Forestry Minister didn't come out. Our own MLA, our NDP MLA, did not come out. North Island needs someone who understands and respects the natural resource industries, encourages small business, someone who understands cash flow and can find the opportunities where legislation or old ways of thinking are blocking our future. I'm that guy. My wife and I have two kids, two 90-year-old parents, one grandchild, Pete. We need someone who will stick up for our grandchild and our aging parents. I will do that. Calling an unnecessary election during a pandemic is pure political greed. The NDP were up in the polls and got power hungry. That's not about you. It's not about your family or the North Island. The world's in a tizzy, calm, thoughtful leadership that can bring us up and out of the hole. The BC Liberal are those leaders. That's our track record. My name is Norm Facey. I'm asking you for your vote as a BC Liberal on the North Island. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Norm. Michelle? Thank you. Uh, tonight, I'm asking you to make a very important choice, a choice that will help determine the direction the North Island and the province goes in for the next four years. You can make the choice to go back to the old BC Liberal agenda with 16 years of looking out for those at the top, increasing MSPs and hydro rates, raiding ICBC and plummeting forestry jobs. 16 years of empty promises and no gains for the workers of BC. What Andrew Wilkinson is offering you now is more of the same old, same old. Or you can make the choice to invest in the BC NDP Clean BC Plan that is a pathway to a more prosperous, balanced and sustainable future Invest in people with our $10 a day childcare plan and affordable housing plan, or invest in a strong economic recovery plan that will help everyone get through this unprecedented pandemic together. That would be a vote for the John Horgan government. I'm proud of the work that he's done to date, and I want to join his team so that I can go to work for the people of the North Island. 
on October the 24th. I'm asking you to exercise your right to vote. My name is Michelle Babchuk. I'm your BC NDP candidate for North Island, and I'm asking for your support. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle. John? Right, thank you very much. Thank you to you, Mr. Moderator, and all the other candidates and the Port McNeil Chamber for doing this. Um, I support family values. I uh, would be a stronger voice in Victoria, uh, and regardless of which party forms government, I support the environment and the economy. Uh, I'm uh, in favor of business growth. Uh, I support fiscal responsibility and self-sufficiency. And uh, I'm probably not gonna get elected, but if I did, I'd be a good representative for the whole constituency, the North North Island included. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks, John. Alex? I am not naive. I know there's very diverse opinions around here. I know some of the things I've said tonight probably concern families. But I also know there is a great deal of wisdom in the communities of the North Island. And my job will be to facilitate the really hard discussions that we need to have so that our children are not left in a wasteland. We have to get as many jobs as possible out of each tree. Productive old growth forest, however, is not a renewable resource. Those areas are holding the life that allows our forest to thrive. I realize that companies are making more money selling raw logs, but we need access to that wood that grows to, uh, to grow our economy. We have to be thinking about the local economies. Let me be clear, I'm not against aquaculture. I see the processing plant in Port Hardy uh, as an asset and all of you that can grow fish as an asset to this province. But this industry cannot continue as it is. It has to get out of the water. They can't control their lice. That is, there's no evidence that they can control their lice and stop killing off the wild salmon. So the province needs to support the workers on the salmon farms as they're removed from the water and turn to Canadians and say, where do you want to do land based? Because there's already land based happening, uh, but the Norwegian agriculture industry is overshadowing it. So we need to work with the Canadians. I know how hard it is to deal with these large companies. And so I think that the next government that is formed needs to be diverse. There needs to be a green rudder on this to try to steer us in a direction that will protect us from the greatest impacts of climate change. We need to learn to thrive while the world around us thrives. And really, most importantly, that we give our children a chance to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So that concludes our, uh, our debate and our closing remarks. Uh, I'd like to say on behalf of the Port Meal Chamber of Commerce and the North Island as a whole, that we thank you for giving of your time and introducing introducing yourself to the residents of the Regional District of Mount Waddington. I wish you good luck in your campaign, stay safe, and have a good evening. Gila Kasla, <laughs> signing you. off. Thank you, Eric. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.